Everybody. Hey, everybody. Hey. 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 How's startup week been this week? Good. Hey. Awesome. Great. Awesome. Show of hands, how many people in the room in some way uh, are a consumer of analytics in, in your respective organizations? Awesome. Show of hands, how many work for or own a startup? Fantastic. Um, show of hands, last question. How many of you do the dirty work of actually working with data? And then the remainder, presumably, consume it, not necessarily do the dirty work. Got it. So, I'm John Bastone. I work with the Convergence Consulting Group. We are a local, uh, about 10 year old uh, analytics and data consultancy based in Tampa. We've got about 70 uh, ish consultants, most of whom are, are based in and around Tampa Bay. And the best part of my job is, is working with predominantly local companies and, and helping solve their data and analytics problems. Uh, I really have just three goals for you today. One is to introduce uh, all of you to people that have deep domain expertise in three very different areas that all converge around knowing your customer. And uh, so rather than me talk about all things analytics, I much prefer running a panel and, and ultimately facilitating a conversation between experts and you to get everything you need. So with that in mind, uh, I, you know, I will be driving, uh, moderating the panel, but I would much prefer this to be a conversation between the front of the room and the rest of the room as opposed to just this going on. So ask questions throughout, be bold, you know, this is, this is your hour to really tap into some uh, tremendous insight. So introductions is, is one piece, just introducing you to these uh, experts. Number two is to inform. Uh, they have very three very distinct, strong points of view, takes on what you need to do to really leverage the power of analytics as a, as a lever to drive innovation. All three companies do three very different things, but the analytics, understanding customer behavior, understanding measurement, understanding how to do things to drive revenue, to drive engagement, to drive better understanding customers is, is core to what these companies do. Uh, and so we'll be informing you about that. And ultimately, we hope that some of the ideas cross-pollinate, you know, across the brains in this room and vice versa, that there are some things that they learn from you that ultimately inspire uh, you to you know, take some sort of kernel of insight and, and drive value in your respective businesses. So as I said, who I represent, I work for Convergence Consulting Group. This is my only side, Tampa Bay, uh, Tampa Bay's analytics consultancy. We really do three things. <laughs> Strategy and management as, as it pertains to unleashing the power of your data and analytics. That tends to be the area of the business where I live. Uh, we also do business intelligence slash advanced analytics, so building reporting and dashboards, doing a lot of work in the area of performance management to help companies better understand what's working, what's not. Uh, as, and then finally, information management, just uh, housing all that data, getting a single view of the customer, consolidating in a way where you can actually get stuff out of it. Coolest thing about the company I work for, besides the fact that we're all local, is the fact that we're agnostic as it relates to tech. I, I grew up in, in a software world where uh, I worked at SAS for six years in, in the advanced analytics space, and every problem that I was there to solve for a client could be answered by SAS and no other software, and, and it's refreshing to work for a company where we've got the entire palette, or well, toolkit, if you will, of, of tools that we can advise clients on, on how to use. So whether it's SAS or MicroStrategy or IBM, uh, or whether it's working through analyst firms like Gartner and Forrester, uh, or, or Microsoft SAP, we, we bring the totality of the, of the BI space uh, to bear when we're trying to solve uh, questions, uh, answer questions. So ultimately, with that in mind, I'm here to kind of kick things off and, and give you a framework of, of why we put the panel the way, together the way we did. Uh, as all of you know, there are a ton of macro trends, a ton of, of, of things going on in the commercial space as it relates to to data and analytics. Three, three trends would include this proliferation, this explosion of consumer data. I read one stat recently where every day, every individual on, on the globe is, is, is spooling out in excess of two megabytes of data, whether that's search terms on, 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 a, on a Google website, whether it is uh, geolocation data as it relates uh, to uh, you know, GPS, whether it's what I buy, 
in, 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 in a retail store, whether it's a, an app that I actually consume online, all of that data is flowing in bits and bytes all over the damn place. Uh, and, and that is really creating a lot of challenges for businesses and making sense of that, but it also creates a lot of opportunities for companies that uh, come up with a purpose and a specific use case around how to, to monetize that. Another uh, uh, macro trend is just the proliferation of devices. So people are putting out a lot of data, but also devices, great machines, are, are putting out a lot of data. Um, through technologies like telematics and the fact that you can have RFID chips for, for virtually nothing on, on any specific uh, uh, you know, commodity. By 2020, it's projected that over 50 billion devices out there will be, will be smart connected, will be essentially wired into the, the, you know, the network that is uh, the, the internet. And then gaming, you know, this, is, this is something I encounter a lot uh, as, as a trend. Uh, you know, whether it's fantasy football, or you know, casinos essentially you know blowing out really online uh, gaming uh, establishments uh, or capabilities, or whether it's just a sweepstakes of some kind. It, the gaming industry is is driving data volume in a way that that's projected to grow to over 500 petabytes per month by 2020. A lot of a lot of people engage in, in some uh, form of gaming. So the implications of these things as it relates to analytics include. Uh, you know, as it relates to consumer data, uh, th there's been a world of prol proliferation. It's never been easier to tie into, to, to opt in for some sort of loyalty program, uh, whether it's Best Buy or Verizon or, or Target. It, you know, as a consumer, in some way, giving a little bit of my information for the quick pro quo of discounts and, and personalized uh, uh, promotions. It's gotten to a point where it's estimated uh, an average of about 20 uh, loyalty schemes that any individual a consumer actually opts into uh, through, through that, that, that adult's uh, lifetime, half of which are actually uh, used on, a, on an active basis. Uh, another implication from a device perspective, <coughs> Internet of Things. Internet of Things is this big abstract thing, not unlike uh, big data. And uh, you're seeing it manifest itself in all kinds of ways, whether it's the notion of, of uh, automobiles being completely uh, autonomous and, and streaming a ridiculous amount of data uh, uh, you know, about driving habits and about location, or whether it's, it's you know, any other number of devices, uh, the, 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 the data that's flowing from, from machines has never been bigger. Uh, and then engagement marketing. So the, the notion of what an advertisement is or what a promotion is is completely changing. And there are a lot of lessons from a gaming uh, perspective in terms of you got to do something a little more than just present something uh, to a consumer. You've got to give them incentives. You've got to engage them. You've got to give them rewards, give them a, a, a sense of, uh, of something more. And, and, and the notion of marketing is changing, is changing. That's really driving engagement for marketing. And campaigns that do this, that, that, that tap into some of the fundamentals of gaming, uh, are yielding 25% more value for brands. So ultimately, as it relates to loyalty, Internet of Things, engagement marketing, there are three companies here today that have very strong deep takes on that and how they've ultimately harnessed analytics and understanding customers to monetize uh, uh, that data. We've got uh, Dave Andrew Dacus from, from Kobe. My turn. Uh, yep, I'm with uh, Kobe Marketing. Uh, just a real brief uh, primer on what we do. Uh, we run loyalty programs. And so we think about any type of program where you get points or miles or engagement of some kind like that. We're usually one of the machines that's uh, that's running that. So our, our customers run in, in data uh, elements saying customers from the thousands up into the hundreds of millions. Um, and uh, so we get quite a bit of information and as we're answering questions back and forth, I'm going to talk quite a bit about how you can take these huge company principles and apply them at a, at a local or smaller developing level because they're all really true no matter what size you are. Thanks. My name is Melind Pogbar Mirkar and I'm the president of Prea Tech, which is right across the street. Um, we, what we do is we create engagement through fun experiences. So you may have seen one of our kiosks. We have these nine foot kiosks in malls, seven of eight malls here in Tampa. Uh, where you can go up and play a game to win a prize. And what we do, is, and by the way, it's called In to Win, is the name of our consumer brand. And what we promise you is that we will not sell your data when you play for our prize promotion. 
and that after you play for our prize promotion, you will always win something. So you will get a random coupon or offer if you don't actually win the grand prize. And what it is, it's a it's a clean, fun way, you know, uh, safe way for you to play prize promotions. We also exist on the mobile app as well. Um, we've been very well received. We've had uh, 270,000 engagements in three months and 40,000 registered users, and we're giving out prizes every day and connecting hands with, with people. JP? I'm JP Avalo. I work for Nielsen. How many people have heard of Nielsen here? So we're big. In fact, we're a big goal for me. We're in 106 countries. We have uh, over 45,000 employees. And in Tampa, we have 3,000 people. We actually have the uh, worldwide headquarters of uh, innovation and engineering right here in Tampa Bay. So we've been around for about uh, 92 years, right? and uh, we play a key role in the advertising ecosystem in the U.S. and worldwide, but especially in the U.S. where the Nielsen uh, ratings system uh, drives about $100 billion a year worth of uh, advertising bucks. So what we do is we measure the consumer, we develop a deep understanding of the consumer, and for this ratings, that is the currency that the advertisers, the publishers use to decide the value of a nine on TV, uh, on radio, and increasingly on the web and mobile. Awesome. Uh, I'll start with uh, you, Dan, in terms of questions. So, um, I've got a little bit of background, and I have uh, consumer analytics as well. And I know um, one of the leading industries as it relates to leveraging consumer data in a way that's that's uh, really personalized and, and really engenders loyalty is, is the casino industry. And, and I've seen some pros and cons as it relates to uh, sort of real-time uh, uh, interaction with hosts on the casino floor to you know, better uh, meet the needs of, of like gamers that are, that are spending millions of dollars, you know, uh, things of that sort. So, um, and, you know, to a certain extent, it drives an almost eerie level of personal, personalization. It's not yeah. just for guests. Uh, can you? That's just one example. Can you cite some other examples of how loyalty programs are, are evolving from sort of the 1980s era points-based uh, loyalty yeah. programs into something that's that's much more personalized? Yeah, it's a great example. Casinos are they're actually when I look industry by industry, there's different levels of sophistication when it comes to a loyalty program. And, and you know. Airlines are what everybody's are everyone's familiar familiar with. The airlines or retail and things like that. Casinos, it's just not even fair what they can do. <laughs> because their their upside for getting it right is huge. Right? Yeah. If they capture you for another day, it's just like this clock ticking of money spooling out of your bank account in, into theirs. And you know, a lot of people think casino, the business is about uh, gambling and getting you there at the tables. It rel yeah. only represents about twenty to thirty percent of their revenues. It's the events, it's the food, it's the, uh, the lodging, all the things that happen while you're there that, that really make their, their money for them. And when you think about that breadth of different ways to engage with you, they're not just collecting a transaction and saying, how do I upsell them on more ketchup? They're saying, <laughs> how do I learn about them over here at the table and somehow derive something that helps me understand what kind of room they should have or which show that they should go see, or so on and so forth. It's a lifestyle that they have to pick up right away. And if you've been to Vegas recently and you get in a taxi cab, the first thing you're going to see is Steve Wynn's place has got a, a, a little uh, monitor right there in the taxi cab saying, come to my place, come to Steve Wynn's, and uh, what, 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 the wind, the wind too now. Uh, <laughs> come over here and spend your money. And, and it's amazing because right there you can pay with points from his program in the taxi cab. They've really stretched out in, into engagement. And so I say that oftentimes you're part of the, the, the question was around how do you move from the 80s into more modern times. Uh, you're actively part of it without knowing it quite often. Points programs used to be, I'm going to calculate what you did, I'm going to give you an award, you're going to hold it in your hand, you're going to come back in and redeem it here. And that's my program and that's, that's what loyalty means. Now they calculate what you mean to them your likelihood to interact, the awareness of other things around you, and they might push you into a type of engagement, not give you a physical reward. So it's more of a scoring system. Sometimes they give you points for your score, 
sometimes they push you into engagement. So each industry has, has matured differently than, than others. I'll say the worst right now is probably telecom, but they're getting there. They've got a lot of data, but it's still a locked in like two-year contract type of, type, of, type of stuff. Grocery retailers are, you know, they're, they're getting there as well, but casinos, airlines, they're just like just really interesting things. So really, I mean, I'll let you kind of dovetail it. To what extent is, is customer loyalty, you know, applied to your business? Oh, it's massive. Um, when you looked at, you know, technology disrupting industries, certainly the advertising industry, right? We've, um, digital is, is dominating the advertising industry today. Google is bigger than the top 10 traditional you know, uh, media companies mm -hmm. like NBC, you know, AB, uh, Disney, so on. You know, Turner Broadcasting. Add them all together. Google's doing better than that. So, uh, and when you look at di uh, digital, it's all about how do you engage with consumers. So we use game mechanics at in the win to get people to engage with their brands in a fun way. It's just really um, when you look at advertising, you have companies out there spending over two hundred billion dollars a year trying to get to you, the consumer, simultaneously you as the consumer are doing everything you can to avoid them. <laughs> is, that, is that funny? I, like you can fast forward through commercials and you know you got preset radio stations and Pandora and everything else. Um, so what we focus on is voluntary engagement, right? It, it's, it's much more powerful when a consumer engages a brand versus a brand trying to engage a consumer. And then you know, just dovetailing on what you're saying, um, it's, you know, we use this, we have this massive kiosk and everybody focuses on us, the kiosk. The kiosk is just a means to getting you to the mobile. <laughs> That's what we want to do. We want to, we want to create this awesome experience beyond on this nine foot kiosk and you'll walk away from it going, that was a valuable experience. I saved money or I won prizes and I got some loyalty points and, and I can now do it on my phone. And now we're going to measure behavior, just dovetailing into what you just said, um, that helps us drive promotions that meet your preferences, right? When you look at regular coupon.com or something like that, it just doesn't resonate with a lot of people because you have to search for what you like. What we want to do is figure out what you guys are looking for and then be there when you're ready to make that purchase. So, JP, uh, when I think of consumer measurement, I mean, I, I think of Nielsen. You know, in, in being this, this best of the best in terms of you know really investing a lot of time and expertise and, and know-how around that. What and, and there's a lot of buzz around the Internet of Things, and a lot of that buzz tends to deal with concepts like big data and, and what devices are, are going to be spawning off and how that's going to drive a certain main amount of AI capability, artificial intelligence. But fundamentally, right, Nielsen is is a it's a consumer marketing measurement company. What's Nielsen have to gain as it relates to its core uh, about better understanding customers and segments as, as they relate to marketing programs and, and Internet of Things? Like what's the what's the implication? So um, I'm sorry, to, I think to your point, um, a lot of consumers react negatively to us. Yeah. Today. Uh, we've seen the rise of ad blockers on the way. About, I guess, we're about a third of all ads on the web block today, and over 50% of millennials block ads. Wow. And fortunately, advertising pays for content on Can the web. Can you see that? It's really hard for us to hear. Okay, I'll try. <laughs> <laughs> I usually have a microphone. So, um, the point I was trying to make is uh, advertising is increasingly intrusive, increasingly getting into people's faces. <laughs> and the reason, the fundamental reason behind that, advertising at the base is there to deliver value. It's supposed to deliver a message to the right people, people who need it. And today, it's a broadcast mechanism where you're paying the odds. If 1% of consumers find the message interesting, it's a win, but they still annoy 99% of consumers. So we find that advertising on the internet things that improve a little bit, but it also become very creepy. Now, ads start to follow you around, and people react that, to that even more negatively, yeah. by blocking the ads. So at, at, the, at the fundamental basis, what's important is to have what we call a very good audience segmentation mechanism. We need to put you in the right bucket that advertisers are buying. So a bucket of people who are looking for BMWs that can also uh, have a good sound system and also like to buy pizza. I mean, you can have a very complicated <laughs> segment. 
three years ago when I joined Nielsen, we had 66 segments. Today we have over 30,000. And in the future we're going to have even more. And the way we do that, we went from 66 to 30,000 by following what people do on the web and on mobile. But that's only part of your life. It's only an inaccurate uh, view of what we do as a consumer. Most of your life is still live offline today. And with the Internet of Things, uh, devices that have a lot of sensors are trying to, uh, to, to, to become common in our everyday lives are able to measure what we do in our, off in our offline um, time habits, run your home, run your house, in the cities. And these are all new data points that could be used to more precisely understand who you are as a person and put you in the right bucket for advertisers that want to uh, uh, show you a, a nod or send you a message. So speaking of... Uh Creepiness, right? That there's <laughs> no. um, there's a lot of concerns uh, within within businesses I certainly speak with as it relates to guidelines on customer privacy, customer data privacy, personally identifiable data. Uh, how much is too much? How far is too far as it relates to what you can capture or stitch together uh, about a customer? Uh, and I. I know in the U.S. Uh, the the guidelines from year to year and sometimes to month to month are a bit elastic and, and, and ambiguous at, at, at best. It's, it's something a lot of companies um, struggle with. But I also know that, that marketers that have been at it and businesses that have been at it for a long time just have come up with some tried and true good rules, good sort of rules of engagement as it relates to what you do with customer data, how you collect it, how you ask for permission to have it collected, how you leverage it, and how you ultimately run a responsible business. And I'd, I'd love to get your takes uh, collecting on that. Uh, yeah, that one. Yeah, it is. It is <laughs> because look, ultimately, the line that you're crossing is the creep factor. But um, in the U.S., it's the creep factor because we're quite liberal with what we can do with customer data. In other countries, it's a legal barrier that you're crossing with what you're actually doing with customer data, and that bar is set much, much, much lower than it is in the U.S. Uh, we did some, I had, I had a client that is like the greatest client on the planet, it's Lego, right? And so just think about it, it's as fun as it, would, as it sounds, like toys and fun and kids and things like that. We did a global research project for them to understand this exact question. What can we do with data? And if you go by the laws to set the standards, you'd end up going with, well, what's the strictest country out there? It's probably something like Germany or one of the others. And you set the standard there, and then you can't do any real marketing anywhere. Right? The, the, the thing that you need to do is to change that conversation. If you're, if you're sitting there thinking as your first step, what's the most I can get away with? <laughs> That's not a great relationship. I mean, think about that from your personal relationships. Okay, honey, I'm going out. That's the most I can get away with, right? So, so you, you have to change that to, to something else because in every single country I've worked in, and I've worked in a lot, there is a way to get around what the laws are, and that is getting permission and acknowledgement from the customers to say, yes, I want you to consume my data and use it. Okay, so now it comes down to a conversation of, here's what I'd like to do with your data. What would you like me to do with your data? And if you can reach a mutual understanding, they open the doors wide open. Help your customers. Put that data to your customers good first, and they will open the doors wide open for you to do whatever you want with it. So share it. Who's, who's a shining example who does that really well? Um, well, a lot of the, uh, I, don't, I don't know if there's a shining example of that. Um, I really don't. There are some great examples of companies who, who do that in the U.S., but it's usually with a um, with some type of thing within the value chain of what you're trying to do. You're going on a flight, but you need to rent a car. Can I send some information over to this car rental company on your behalf to do that? Well, that makes a lot of sense, right? Yeah. But that's not what we're trying to do. That's, that's 80s and 90s, and we can, we can do that all day long. How do I understand enough about you and your life so that I can start designing products that will appeal more to you? How do I understand how you want to be communicated to so I'm not wasting time on text or email or other things as well? And in having a conversation through a preference page or a preference center when you start uh, engaging with them or actually having people talking to them, you can learn enough so that you can start to have an open conversation. And last thing I'll say is just like every relationship, set it up in a way that you can expand that as you trust each other more. Because as you trust each other more, 
keep talking about what you're willing to share with each other, and the data becomes more and more accessible to you and your partners. So, Melinda, you must have a, a take on, on privacy because you, you, you are essentially brokering the yeah. relationship between brands and, and the consumers at the end of the day. Yeah, we are an aggregator of price promotion. So, when we did our studies you know, early on, what do people hate about price promotions? Oh, you're just signing up and they're just grabbing your data and selling it. And it's the truth. You know, probably 90% of the companies are doing that. So when we built Intuendo, it was revolving around fun, trust, and value. That it's going to be a fun experience when you play. That's going to be a trusted experience when you play. We're not going to sell your data. And that there's always a value. Like, the worst thing is when you sign up for a prize promotion, you just never hear from the company. We're going to let you know right then and there what you want and that you want instantly. So we're really consumer-centric about this experience. Um, there's been other companies, I've seen digital companies online that have done you know, things like us, um, but they let the, the brands take over the experience. They, you know, I, I did something um, on a, I forget the name of it, but um, where, I, where it said I won something playing a game, and then I pushed the button to go redeem it, and they sent me to 7 Eleven website and asked me to register. I go, wow, that's a bad experience. So the whole point to it is that I believe, you know, today we're, as consumers, we're more educated than we've ever been. Um, you can't buy your way into people's lives. You can't fool people anymore. You've got to be sincere with the product you're coming out and have a sincere offer, and that resonates with people. And I know the Nielsen perspective on customer data is, is, is strong as well. You, you want to explain? Sure. So one of the things I do in Nielsen is uh, actually I work in engineering R&D. You mentioned that before. But I, I focus on the future of the internet, where it should be going. I'm on the advisory committee for W3C. I'm the co-chair of the privacy and security <coughs> uh, subcommittee in the IT consortium. I'm on the board of IoT World and AI World. I'm also a judge in the CES Innovation Awards. So one of the key things about privacy and security, and I agree with two of the panelists, it's all about trust. And the problem is when you're a company that sells products to consumers, and you also ask them for, for their data, there's a basic conflict of interest in the trust relationship. So you can, you can really only get consumer data, uh, the consumer's data and get uh, the trust with that if you are in an independent third party company, if you don't sell them anything. If you actually can represent them and serve their interests, and that's basically what, what we do at Nielsen. We don't sell anything to consumers, we don't influence them, we never heard about the Nielsen as a consumer. But we, try to measure in a very um, non-influential manner, in a very uh, anonymous manner, uh, how products are being used, uh, what media you watch, what ads are being watched, how effective the ads are, and we help define what the value of the ecosystem is um, in the end for the benefit of the consumers. So when we look at the, uh, at the internet or the web, today it's fairly secure to do a transaction with, with your bank account. Trust going online and logging into your bank account and sending money around. This hasn't been major security breaches. Other services that are less transaction focused, like using Yahoo, a million account reached three times now in the last six months, it's a little bit less secure. But when you go at, at the Internet of Things, your home router, your security cameras, your DVRs, mm -hmm. on October 21st, there was the first ever uh, IoT based um, security breach. Right? DDoS attack, the denial, distributed, distributed denial of service attack that took advantage of the fact that these tens of millions of uh, devices in their homes were not secure. They were shipped with default passwords and usernames. And it was very easy with, for hackers to use a standard password list and get access to these uh, home devices and install a, a botnet on it that would uh, start flooding major uh, websites like New York Times, uh, Google and others. On the, and effectively took down the internet in the West Coast just using home devices. So it's all about, it's, it's not that security is not possible, it's very possible in order to do it on the web because it's not been a priority for many of the consumer services. And that's also a reflection of the fact that it's a nascent industry where there are startups effectively. I mean, even Yahoo is a big startup in trying to build a service people will, will use or will love to use. And making it secure was not in the top. Um, uh, of their list, and we didn't think if something bad would happen with it. And now that that thing has happened, we have to react. The good news is it can be fixed. The bad news is it hasn't been enough money spent on it. 
And yes, it's true that the approach in the US is different than in Europe. In Europe, it's very uh, based on regulation, and it, frankly, it's, that's, it's probably going to be very, very difficult to enforce. In the US, we tend to uh, choose solutions that are more based on engineering, on high encryption. Uh, take our own, for example, our home kit. They're using a 3,000 bit encryption. It's very, very hard to break today. When we get to quantum computers, it'll be very easy, but for the next 10 years, it'll be very hard to break. But it adds a lot of cost to put a chip that can do this type of hardware decryption. That means that you will never get a home kit enabled devices in a light bulb, for example, because the chip is alone costs about three bucks. It's more than the, the light bulb costs. So um, we will have very high security in the near future, I believe, the first hardware costs have to come down. Yeah. And unfortunately, that's something that's very hard to do when people want to buy the devices. Yeah. So we have a chicken and egg situation. How do we get mass adoption of highly secure devices and also uh, bring their cost down? Perfect. So I, I want to hear from, from the audience. Uh, just you know, We've talked about uh, customer loyalty. We've talked about data privacy. We've, we've gone into security. And I'm just curious, if show of hands, how many, how many of you are with a company that in some way is taking consumer or marketing data and, and coming up with a product or service based on it? Who are you with? Actually, back in the Philippines, we had, I had a GOG, a call them Gang of Geeks. We actually... Uh, gang of Geeks? Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's my friend. Uh, so are you part of that gang? <laughs> I manage them. <laughs> but you know they're unmanaged. <laughs> they, they are. They're just, you know, just have to know their soft spot. <laughs> and uh, we do that in the, in the Philippines that's called ethical hacking. So we do, we do actually get go into their computers, but not all the time. You know, I thought, hey, stop, that's that's enough. Uh -huh. So we 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 test all their systems. So we got uh, then some before we before I managed them, they used to do that that they got the data and then sell it, you know, like a bidding. Mm -hmm. So I told them, hey, that's not how things work, you know. <laughs> so that's very good. And a uh, person sitting in front of you, uh, Mark, you, you work with them as well. Well, tangentially, yeah. You know, we work with, um, so we're designing online programs for education. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, is it uh, uh, student ed? Is it adult ed? Is it uh, company ed? What, what kind of? It's higher education, but most part of it's also corporate. Yeah. And so, I mean, to, to what extent do you wrestle with some of these uh, consumer privacy issues? <laughs> well, I don't because I do graphic design. Yeah, we're more on the front end. <laughs> Follow-up question for the panel is uh, around. Um, I mean, how many of you are familiar with the term uh, omni-channel, or have, have heard this term before? So anybody that's in, uh, I look like about twenty percent. So anybody that's in, in marketing tech in some way has, has at some point come across this term, and, and it's um, for those of you that that do work or will work with consumer data marketing data or analytics in general, uh, activating some sort of consumer behavior, it's it's an important concept. And I wanted to, um, rather than define it for you, I wanted to get sort of a, a, a definition from the audience and also uh, from the panel and, 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 and get a take as to why this term is so important in enabling or activating analytic insights about consumers uh, in a way that's, that's more highly productive. So I'll start with you. Yeah, I mean, I mean channels is such a weird thing for me now because I'm seeing channels disappear. Um, I mean, we, we have we have devices, but I mean, how many devices do you have? I mean, when I think about my, my kids and my family and the, the game stations and the, the I mean, channel is almost like a, a, it's just everything around you is stuff. There's, there's all these things. Um, we're seeing less and less campaigns happening. I've got data and I'm going to push an action out. I mean, just this notion of a campaign is, is a little archaic. Experience is blurring with data. And so, on the channel, it's interesting, we, uh, as a company, I'm gonna get off track for a second, as a company, we own the trademark to the word on the channel. I'd like to say we came up with it, we do. And, and this is what this, the company tells us, like, we came up with that. The real story is, 
and we'll look around and found out that nobody trademarked the thing. And, so <laughs> and then and tried to, to fight it one day and found out that you can't look. That's like saying air. You can't. You can't. Trademark Did you trademark right opportunistic as well? No. <laughs> no. So 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 we think we think a, we talk a lot about on the channel, and it's it's you got data coming in, you got data coming out. It's meaningless if it's just a channel of pipelines. What are you doing with that data when you get it? What are you doing with it after you after you push it out? And that's what's changing. And so the, the, we're getting more and more channels. Make your product flexible enough to not only handle the channels that are here, but the, the thousand that will appear in the next year. And so if you're if you're still stuck in in, in the the planning phase of I got to figure out what I'm going to do by text, I got to figure out what I'm going to do by email, I have to figure out what I'm going to do on online. You're, you're probably missing like 900 different channels by which you should be communicating and receiving data. Let me ask a quick question here, because uh, this is a younger group that I'm used to, to dealing with, which makes me feel really old. But does anybody in here know who Dan TDM is? Raise your hand if you know who Dan TDM is. All right, so let me, who knows uh, Minecraft? You guys ever play Minecraft? All right, who owns Minecraft right now? Microsoft. Microsoft owns a Minecraft, but for years it was not Microsoft, right? It was this uh, this guy out of somewhere in Europe. I can't I can't ever remember, but uh, um, it was a user fed community and this kind of stuff. And, and Microsoft bought this, and and you see advertisements all the time for their products and little little toys and things. But what about the software itself? Have you ever seen an ad for Minecraft? But everybody knows about it. All your kids play it. All your friends. Everybody knows about Minecraft. Well, if you watch a, a ten year old or a twelve year old. They're not sitting watching TV flipping the channels anymore. They're on YouTube. And they've got their bloggers that they go to. And they say, this is where I want to hear my information from. And Dan TDM is a famous blogger right now that sits there and comes up with game reviews and all sorts of theories about what's happening behind the square clouds and all this fun stuff. <laughs> and he gets 60 billion views a year. Okay? Think about how many people watch the Super Bowl and they're paying millions of dollars for Super Bowl seconds, right, or Super Bowl slots, and this guy is dwarfing them. And if you actually ask a kid who Dan TDM is, he'll be like, oh, that's a character in the video game, because Microsoft actually is paying this blogger now to have his likeness in their video game. And there's book series that you can buy at Target, and all sorts of stuff. And we as traditional marketers have missed the whole damn thing. Because we're focusing on traditional <laughs> channel marketing. Okay? The sharing economy of people buying stuff and selling stuff to each other and providing services is another channel. So think about YouTube and content is king. Think about YouTube Red. Think about some of the things that Disney is doing. What, what are they doing? Uh, the, what's the Disney My thing? Disney or whatever. They, no, they have a, like a uh, magic makers or music. What is it? My Disney. Yeah, there, there's something. See, we're too old. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they're bringing they're bringing the artists together to communicate with the consumers to bug the parents, and we're missing the whole thing. So my my suggestion is to talk to some kids about <laughs> marketing and, uh, and and expand the views on what image on the channel is. And when you think about that level of information interaction, what it means from a data perspective. And then what it means from an analytics perspective, and then an analytical response. Now we've got a lot of work ahead of us. I think it's really exciting and interesting. Okay. All right. What is it to you? Uh, to us, we, we're very focused on being an omni-channel, meaning that we're taking our in-the-win brand and going across every channel we can to promote ourselves. So, but we want to do it with a real purpose behind. So we create a kiosk, a nine-foot kiosk, we put it in retail locations that give you prizes and rewards because 90% of purchases in certain retail environments are impulsive. You don't even know what you want to buy until you get there. <laughs> so, um, you know, an advertiser trying to reach you on the phone is probably not going to work when you're going to Walgreens, right? Um, so, this kiosk gives you the ability to engage with it at your own, you know, uh, on your own terms. And uh, we take that in the win brand, and uh, we you can play games. You were mentioning the power of games. So, we license Wheel of Fortune. Uh, Jeopardy, Price is Right, and Family Feud. So now we're replicating, you know, reality game show type experiences where you can play Wheel of Fortune to win a, a, a great prize. But not just on the kiosk. We have the rights to do it now on mobile, and we have the rights to do it on Facebook and other social networks. 
So really cool that we're now omni-channel in the respect of mobile and that. But now we're um, we're also uh, striking deals with TV, radio, and newspaper. We've signed a deal with the Tampa Bay Times. We'll be announcing a deal with a top ten media company, uh, you know, in the next week or so, um, where we're actually going to be bundling our prize promotions with their TV and with their radio. And you'll also see it in newspapers like the Tampa Bay Times. And it's our, our way of going on the channel. And for for those traditional companies, those TV and radio stations, it's incredible. I've met with a top 10 media president of one of the top 10 TV stations, and literally what we think is what is actually happening. He's like, my advertisers are asking me how to measure performance of my TV. So that's what we help with. We bought, we help, we grab our digital, tie it to their traditional, mm -hmm. and help build the analytics to it. That's a perfect setup for you. So, uh, historically, Nielsen has measured just what people watch on TV, um, and yes. the last few years, what uh, they listen to on radio, and uh, what they buy in the stores through uh, loyalty card programs. That's not going to work anymore. The world that we're entering now, where everything is distributed, and people have multiple devices, multiple platforms. So, uh, in the last year, we've launched something called Total Audience Measurement. It's about to go uh, global, uh, nationwide uh, in Q2. It's going to be adopted by all of the publishers, uh, all of the TV stations, all of the uh, uh, media companies. And it, what that does, it enables us to measure what people consume in terms of media across all screens. PCs, mobile, tablets, uh, websites, TV. You can start watching movie on TV and, finish, and continue it on the local and finish it um, on yourself. And we can measure what people uh, consume in terms of media across all screens. And uh, what we are noticing is that the impact of uh, that uh, fragmentation is actually not to reduce media consumption, but to increase it. People consume more and more media every week than they did before. By making the screens uh, accessible to premium content, people consume more premium content. And Nielsen played a very big role in this, because before, um, before you can only measure what people watch on TV, and as a result, advertisers were uh, not able to know the ratings of a show that was moved from TV to mobile device, and were not able to, uh, to, 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 to buy ads there. And also, the publishers were concerned because if, if uh, Nielsen was not able to measure what they watch on mobile devices, it could make the uh, ratings of a TV show drop if the audience moved from TV to mobile device. So by measuring mobile, but then by measuring um, the web, and measuring, by measuring everything, we actually enable premium content that was built for TV to move to the other screens and advertising to follow. And we help grow the ecosystem in something that's bigger than before. Mm -hmm. And now, uh, if you remember uh, five, 10 years ago, on, uh, on the web, you could only get uh, small traders. You could, not, you could never get a full movie. Right. Uh, you could never get a full TV station. Why is it possible today to get a full TV station on mobile or on the uh, local or something like that? It's because Nielsen is measuring it. By measuring it, we make that content part of the rating system. We make advertising as valuable on the screens and, and, and like it is on TV. So that's how we make that space. So I've been asking all the questions. We've got about uh, 10 minutes left. Uh, perfect. So, um, that's a question basically for all of you now. But how do you integrate uh, measuring the consumer data uh, according to the psychometric profile of the individual? So, uh, do you have Segmentation according to the behavioral styles of individual or cultures, basically. You also begin to trace this down to specific cultures, also. That's a little easier for us to do it than, than a lot of our, uh, than maybe you guys, I don't know. We have, we have personal data on everybody that, that comes through us, and we get their lifestyle data because they give it to us and what, what they we call it burn, what they use their points for. And those segments fit within, we use Nielsen data and other types of data to, to help us figure that out. So by design, it's set up to do that automatically. Now we've worked with people who are trying to figure out their new business model and we don't have any of that stuff up front and then we're faced with that challenge. Um, I'd actually probably defer to, to my counterparts here because the, the mechanics of doing that is so wide and varied. I see so many different applications. They probably have a better idea of what they think the, the best approach to doing that would be. <coughs>
So for us, um, on the kiosk, every visit, on average, people are playing for six prize promotions. And it's very important that we offer a lot more than that. There's typically our kiosk will have 70 to 100. So they're actually going through it and hyper-targeting the promotions they like. Um, we weave in a non-offensive survey question in the engagement experience. So if you pick Nike sneakers, we might ask you what kind of sneakers would you like to win. If you push running sneakers, we profile you twice. If you play for Nike 100 times that year, we're profiling you through survey questions, through the frequency of how much you engage with that product, and we give you points, very similar to Kobe, for purchasing the product. So now we're, we're measuring your purchasing behavior as well. And we take all of that data. Now our, our mobile app is actually getting 38 plays per month on average. Uh, so that even gets us more richer information. I, can, I, can I actually answer it too? Am I allowed to answer <laughs> <laughs> My panel? Yeah. So I would say, um, well, so there's two, apps, there's two ways to answer your question. And I'll answer it both ways. From, a, from just a mechanics perspective, like how do I do that? Um, there's a whole category of self-service analytics tools that are being commoditized month over month. Just uh, this week, Gartner produced their latest magic project on business intelligence tools. One of the top three was Microsoft. Microsoft's key business intelligence tool is Power BI. You know how much Power BI costs? Zero. So if you have the know-how, if you have the data, if you, have, if you know what you're going after, like barriers to entry from a cost perspective are, are, are evaporating. So there's no, no sort of licensing cost excuses or relates to that. Now from a, the other perspective as well, I've got behavior, I've got purchase, I've got psychographic. What's the strategy around that? I would tell you just from, from professional experience, um, I bias all things towards behavior. Behavior drives targeting. Behavior should drive uh, you know, the offer that you're extending, when you're extending it, within what channel you're extending it in. Um, the psychographics, the demographics, the other sort of attributes around the consumer is about the message. It's, it's, it's how do I best communicate to the customer to sort of reach through the clever. And that's sort of the art and science uh, and where they come together. It's the, 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 the extended demographics of the consumer really are more heavily skewed usually towards the art where what I actually do, what I actually buy, what I actually consume, that's that's the science of, of, of I want to reach in there. That's my take. So um, I like to answer this because there's really two different ways of measuring uh, consumer. Um, you can do what we call census measurement, and you measure what everything measure everything that's been done on the web. You put it on tracking cookies, and you can see what um, what, what how many people use certain websites. And, can try to figure out um, the demographics, the user information. <coughs> and there's a big issue with that, which is PII. It's called personal identifiable information. And there's plenty of rules that prevent uh, companies from using PII or throwing it away. So when we do, when we measure everything, we, we can know uh, how products are used, and we can know, cannot really know who is using them because of regulations and, and privacy rules. But that's actually what advertisers want to know. Want to know who is using the product. So, uh, at Nielsen, we have uh, we have a way to do that, and it's by having very large uh, home panels, about 20, 30,000 households that uh, we select very carefully, and we have a lot of data scientists and uh, and uh, mathematicians to make sure that that population represents the whole population. Very good spread. There's some companies that do have demographics. We have a partnership with Facebook, so we get data from Facebook. So we send them our, our, our trackers, our cookies, and they give us back updated uh, demographic information. But it tends to be heavily biased towards the Facebook, the Facebook audience. So a big problem actually on measurement is bias. Mm -hmm. Everything we measure that is measurable tends to be heavily biased towards the user base of that service. So we don't really know um, how that how that extrapolates to the global um, population. And we have our own panels, this is something we can do. It's something that our retailers want. It's not just actually something that we, we decide, it's something that's audited by the industry. Everything we produce is audited by, by something called the Media Ratings Council. It's a consortium of um, publishers and media companies that uh, use our products that audit our data to make sure they can trust it. Yeah. 
It's not something that's possible with Facebook data, for example, or, or I mean, Google data. We have to trust that they do the right thing. And just recently, Facebook announced that they have overstated uh, some of their numbers by a factor of 10, because nobody was auditing them. And in fact, uh, just this week, PNG announced that going forward, they will require Facebook to be uh, MRC uh, accredited as well. They require aud uh, auditing of all that. So the industry is going towards uh, application. You can't just measure and say, trust my numbers. Thank you. Uh, well, question in that. Thank you, gentlemen, for your presentation. My question is, what's your big data environment? Can you tell us, do I use my own clusters? What is your tool that you use? Cloud data or some other product? Yeah, for us, it's all over the place. Uh, we 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 offer a service that is a decisioning engine, and we have our data that we use, <coughs> and our clients come to the table with theirs, and we have to sit that somewhere and analyze that somewhere. And so, for one client, it may be a very archaic, let's look for this and look alike modeling and th things like that. And for another, we're throwing it into a big data lake. And we're we're trying to uh, pull out, extrapolate uh, themes of information that we're going to apply later on into traditional database marketing. And who hosts that is is up to our arrangement with the client. So when you think about the breadth of data uh, consumption and analysis, we go anywhere from traditional to big data. But it depends on our relationship with the client. I would tell you just uh, because we work with a lot of local clients. Uh, locally, we see on the back end we see Microsoft everywhere. Uh, SQL Server and increasingly uh, Azure, uh, as a lot of shops wanted to push their their back end. In most of these are small clients. Uh, not necessarily. SQL Server has come a long way in, in, as a large scale uh, data warehouse. We're, You'd be I was very surprised. We're processing all of Best Buy's transactions, 110 million members, and all of their transactions using SQL Server. Yeah. Right now. So it's good enough for Best Buy. It's good enough for <laughs> yeah, for a lot of clients. We use SQL as well, and we use Tableau for our dashboards and reportings and so on. But I was just, uh, I, I, Dave probably attest to this. I, I gotta tell you one thing that's astonishing as you go out in the marketplace, um, just the lack of databasing by a lot of companies. Yeah, it's incredible. Um, you know, you look at Amazon, Google, and Facebook, it's all about databasing. And then we work with sports organizations. As a matter of fact, the second largest sports organization in the country, they said 40 million people walk through their uh, stadiums every single year. I said, okay, what's your database? They said, what are you talking about? <laughs> 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 uh, I, I just talked to a restaurant chain that's been around, you know, 10 years, has numerous locations, and I couldn't believe it. I mean, in three months, we almost have the same size database as they do over seven years. So wow. there, there is just, an, I'm sure you can attest this, that retail <laughs> is lost. And I'll tell you, when I was sitting in one of these media uh, meetings I was telling you about in New York, um, one of the guys was hard nosing and saying, we want the data that you get. And I said, we don't provide that data. And um, and his his boss looked at him and goes, what are you going to do with the data anyways? Yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and so, so the problem is, is, you know, you should be data, you know, driving a database, of course, of all your clients. But the, the second question, and you, you know, both of you guys have alluded to this, is, how do you re-engage your consumer in a way that's not offensive and fun? And companies have a very difficult time with that. It's like social media, right? If you want to reach people through social media, it's got to be fun and entertaining. All of a sudden, man, it's just wacky for companies. They can't figure it out. Mm -hmm. So that's how, you know, your database and how do you engage. <coughs> so um, we have our own servers, obviously. Uh, we're, we're a big company. We're the original big data company. Uh, so I can't tell you exactly what we do, but I can tell you that outside we see a lot of traction with AWS. Uh, which is Amazon Web Services, for, for those of you that don't know. We tend to be cheaper, I think, than the server. Thank you, David. Imagine you must have a Yeah, I can't tell you that. Not that it's proprietary. We have maybe four or five companies. Cloud is the important works. I think modern works is the one that the Yahoo exit is not good. The Yahoo exit is not good. The Yahoo exit is not good. The Yahoo and Google map reduce Google site. The Yahoo is not good. So this is on my area actually. Open source framework. It's an open source framework and it's open to everybody. This is not what I do. This is not what I do. But I can tell you we use Hadoop and many other technologies. We are 
out of time, I think, right? Yeah. Right, 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 right